This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, surgeries cancelled. A second water main break at the QE2 hospital leaves the facility with no running water, but a fix is on the way. Fenced in, neighbours of the Halifax Park once used as a homeless encampment question why it remains cordoned off. And Merlin on the move. The museum mascot is leaving Halifax for Ontario because of depression. That slushy snow mixed with rain will taper off to showers and drizzle through tonight, lingering for Friday. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. A major water issue is continuing to cause a lot of problems at the QE2 hospital in Halifax. A pair of broken water pipes has forced the cancellation of some surgeries and left the hospital without heat for nearly two days. As we hear in this report from the CBC's Paul Palmiter, crews are working to fix the problem so more surgeries don't have to be scrapped. As if one water main break wasn't bad enough, another one broke overnight while crews were making repairs to a pipe that broke yesterday. The hospital has no running water and it's led to the cancellation of surgeries. The most significant impacts are to surgery and dialysis, so it's difficult to proceed with, uh, it's not possible to proceed with dialysis and difficult to proceed um, with surgery under these conditions. The pipes that have broken are located inside the hospital's power plant. Patients and staff at the site, which includes the infirmary, the Veterans Memorial Building and the Abbey J Lane, are being forced to use portable toilets, where some have even been put in place in ambulance bays. Temperatures inside the buildings are much cooler than normal and stormy weather is expected for the next day or two. The other concern is that we don't have uh, capacity for um, uh, fire suppression or a sprinkler system today, so we're needing to uh, be vigilant about that. The emergency department at the hospital remains open. Water hoses were being hooked up today to a fire hydrant outside the hospital and being run into the power plant where it's hoped the boilers would be brought back into service to at least provide heat to the buildings. We have to anticipate emergencies like this um, related to uh, aging infrastructure. Nobody wants this to happen. It's been very disruptive and we understand that for patients and staff and family. How long the water and heat issues will continue remains to be seen, but it's putting a lot of stress on staff. They have to leave uh, the floor and the facility to be able to go out and, and use washrooms and, and seek water for hand washing stations. It's just added stress to already very difficult working conditions. The health authority says the demolition that is now underway to build a new expansion at the site has had nothing to do with the water problems. If the issues continue to persist, it's possible some patients may have to be moved to other facilities. Paul Palmiter, CBC News, Halifax. And an update to that story, Nova Scotia Health has confirmed heat is now restored to the QE2's Halifax Infirmary site and water is expected to be running later this evening. The provincial government is abandoning legislation to consolidate the county and town of Antigonish, citing concerns from residents stemming from a recent meeting with Premier Tim Houston. Municipal Affairs Minister John Lohr says there was just not enough public support despite both councils voting in favour of the merger. The reality is we see significant community uh, opposition to it and significant number of people who aren't sure that it's the right thing to do. And uh, I think it says that even at that, we want uh, councils to have pretty broad-based support from their own public uh, on, on the question. The proposed merger has been controversial and resulted in a court challenge by a group of residents. But last December, the Nova Scotia Supreme Court ruled that both councils had the legal right to ask the province for permission to consolidate. One poll earlier this year found more than 75% of respondents wanted a public vote on the issue. A small Halifax park that was once the site of a homeless encampment is still fenced off after months of delays. Some neighbours are questioning why it's taking so long and why they weren't consulted. But others are happy to keep it up until it's safe to remove. Haley Ryan has more. The fencing around Mar Park on Chibucto Road has been there since the city closed the homeless encampment here two summers ago. 
No one's been able to use the park for well over a year and a half now, and it's, it's a real shame, and you can't really get any answers. Area resident David Walbridge says he was among the many neighbors who cooked meals and bought tents for those living here, often called People's Park. The camp was closed in August 2022 when people moved to other sites or shelters. Walbridge says he'd hoped to see open consultation about park upgrades, but that didn't happen. They did do some limited consultation with a select number of people, and so it sort of seemed like, well, once they do that, it should be public. It shouldn't be a private consultation because it is a public park. City staff told Walbridge only immediate neighbours were asked for feedback on a new design back in 2022. Some work has been done, like new lighting and a paved path. The city told CBC soil remediation and park benches are planned, with landscaping and planting expected this spring. They say the fence will come down after that, but the area remains unsafe for use until that point. Clarence Short is looking forward to the time when students from nearby schools can have lunch in the park again. But he's worried about a repeat of the encampment, which the city says had serious health and safety issues. It is tr very traumatic for some. Um, the, some of the violence and the physical altercations were out of hand. Um, the police come into the park nonstop for, they call the police on themselves, also neighbors called police on themselves. The fires got too large, um, several tents burnt down. Other tent sites in the city were recently closed, but more will likely be needed as the weather warms. Those have not yet been identified. Short says lessons should be learned from Mar Park and not have a site next to homes and schools. Give facilities, um, show up with, um, you know, supports to help them have a little better life. Uh, and room, they need a little bit of room. Uh, you put too many tents in one spot and uh, it gets contaminated pretty fast. The rat population that we had over here was like Victoria Park. They were everywhere. Until a firm timeline is made on the reopening of Mara Park, the fence remains. Haley Ryan, CBC News, Halifax. The provincial government is boosting the reward in the missing persons case of Devin Marsman to $250,000. It's only the second time the reward under the province's major crimes reward program has been increased for a specific case. The then 16-year-old went missing in February of 2022 from the Spryfield area and hasn't been heard from since. By October of 2022, Halifax Regional Police determined the teen's disappearance was suspicious and investigators believe there are people who may have information that could result in Devon being located. A number of searches, rallies and marches have been held since his disappearance. Devon is described as being 5 feet tall, about 100 pounds, with blue-green eyes and short, dark hair. Anyone with information is asked to call police. The Nova Scotia government has cancelled a long-standing $30,000 a month subsidy to preserve a rail line that runs across Cape Breton Island. The province says it's because the subsidy no longer makes economic sense as the rail line has deteriorated. It could also cost between $300 and $500 million to restore. The province has put more than $18 million into subsidizing the rail line over the last 20 years. Despite that, no trains have run across Cape Breton since 2015. Parks Canada and Gulf North Properties have announced the closure of the historic main lodge at the Celtic Lodge at the Highlands Golf Resort in Cape Breton. Gulf North says the condition of the 80-year-old main lodge has proven to be a challenge. It also confirms the closure of several cottages. The company says it will take tens of millions of dollars to improve the properties to the point they would meet current standards for electrical, heating, air conditioning and accessibility. Meanwhile, the company says it will continue to operate the nearby Highland Links golf course as well as other accommodations at the site. A weeks-long strike at the Autoport facility in Eastern Passage is now over after union members ratified a new three-year collective agreement. More than 230 unionized workers at the CN Autoport facility walked off the job in late February. Unifor says each year of the agreement will see wage increases with lump sum bonuses in the first two years. It says there will also be an additional paid personal day 
and improvements to vacation, pensions and the cost of benefits. A tentative agreement was announced late Tuesday with union members voting on Wednesday. Ryan Snodden with us now to talk weather. Yeah, and a sloppy day out there. Yeah, absolutely. It uh, was uh, getting a little slick and snowy, especially for inland higher terrain areas, and it's continuing to do so for eastern areas. Things have improved in the west. We'll time it out in just a sec. Look at the warnings that are in place. Special weather statements in effect for everybody. The Tri-County area has a wind warning. That's the best chance of gusts near 90 along parts of the coast. There's a lay sweat wind warning, gust to 120 there overnight into tomorrow morning. A snowfall warning for Victoria County, the Cape Breton Highlands in particular. That's where we could see 30 centimeters of snow. And yeah, in terms of that additional snowfall, this is uh, over the next 24 hours, so you can see we're pretty much done for the west and just some slushy accumulation. It's the east where inland higher terrain areas 5 to 10, maybe some pockets of 15. Cape Breton anywhere from 5 to 15 centimeters for tonight into tomorrow morning. But again, the highlands will continue to see that snowfall through the day on Friday, while much of the rest of the island will wrap up as we move through the same mid morning as we transition over to some rain. We are going to be looking at uh, those temperatures. You can see we're right around the freezing mark just above in most cases, and that's going to be the case through tonight. And again, for tomorrow, we're going to be looking at those temperatures bumping up as this system works off to the north. Note the snow starting to taper off now in the Halifax area, at least lightning for sure. Colchester, Cumberland, the Northumberland shore, and now rolling into Cape Breton. This is where we're seeing kind of the meat and potatoes of this snowfall. There's the system, and it is going to be taking its time moving out of the region and lots of mess. Lighter mess, but a mess nonetheless. Showers mixed with some flurries well back to the west in the Great Lakes, and that will all slowly slide eastward. So note tonight that uh, heavier snow continues to push up into Cape Breton. We're transitioning to showers and drizzle for the rest of the mainland. Tomorrow morning, Cape Breton transitions over to showers and drizzle, except for the highlands. Note for Friday, we'll see some breaks where we may even see the sun. Southerly winds tomorrow will bump our temperatures up. There's the low south of Yarmouth. And yeah, finally it moves out through the later stages of Saturday into Sunday morning. Some lingering showers and flakes even on Sunday. There's that big blue H we're waiting for, and that will push in just in time for Monday. I've got an update on that solar eclipse forecast with your seven day coming up. Yeah, yeah. do stay tuned for Sounds that. Okay, good. thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you. Well, Monday's solar eclipse being billed as a once in a lifetime event is certainly fast approaching. Tiffany Fields from the Burke Gaffney Observatory at St. Mary's University says most of Nova Scotia will only see a slight effect, but she's warning everyone should take precautions when taking in the spectacle. During maximum eclipse, I'm interested in hearing uh, for those that stay around the area, if we notice the sky gets just a little bit darker, not very much, but just a little bit, maybe the temperature will drop just a little bit uh, as we get towards that maximum eclipse. So here in Nova Scotia and uh, during any of the other phases, the partial phases of the eclipse, anywhere you are in the Maritimes, it's important to observe the eclipse safely. So with something like a pair of eclipse glasses or an indirect method. I'll talk to Tiffany Fields about the big day and what you need to know about it. That's our newsmaker just after 6.30. Monday's eclipse also has some people in the Maritimes wondering about their pets' safety. In short, you do not need to get solar glasses for your cats and dogs, but an expert says there are some things you should know. The CBC's Laura Meter has more. It's a normal day out here now, but on Monday at eclipse time, it will be much different out here. Christina Hare doesn't expect her dog to notice, but they won't be out here walking during it. I'm not really concerned because she does sleep really well during the night, um, so I don't think it'll throw her off too much. She might have a nap and I'll make sure to maybe not take her outside during that time. Specialists in animal behavior say an eclipse can cause pets or farm animals to act differently, especially if they're already nervous. This could set them off just a little bit. Um, the big response that is reported is one of nonspecific fear or anxiety, simply because this is so uncertain. Dr. Karen Overall says animals often act as they would at nighttime, but they might also think it's a storm, which could be stressful. For larger animals, having some kind of shelter or a barn can help. Trainers at this Charlottetown track plan to keep their horses in the barn, which is also a darker environment. I'm not necessarily, I don't really know if it would 
harm them or not, but to be on the safe side, just keep them in the barn and just when it kind of passes and then kind of go about your everyday, everyday thing pretty well. Miles Heffernan says it makes sense to protect human and animal eyes, and vets agree. There, there are people who will have, will have goggles for their dog. This veterinarian says it is harder to control larger animals, but pets should be kept inside if they're at risk of looking at the sun. Some animals are far more sensitive to different types of light than we are. So, you know, you'd want to be, you'd want to be a little careful there. In the past, researchers have reported birds gathering on the ground and looking at the eclipse, and some primate animals in zoos have pointed at it, and cows have thought it's milking time. Experts say it's good to plan ahead to keep animals safe. Laura Meter, CBC News, Charlottetown. Halifax's Dalhousie University has been given $1.9 million in federal funding to help the agriculture sector meet emission reduction targets. Canada has pledged to cut emissions from agriculture fertilizer use and methane by 30 percent below 2020 levels by 2030. The Dalhousie-led Common Ground Canada Network will research barriers to reducing carbon output in agriculture operations in the province and how to overcome them. A biotech startup in Dartmouth is revolutionizing protein sources for the aquaculture industry. Denova's scientists have found a way to make a new protein that will eventually feed fish. And they're making it out of methanol-eating bacteria. Kathleen McKenna reports. Brianna Stratton always knew she wanted to change the world. But her challenge was to do it on a scale that mattered. We have to look at the whole system because um, everything's in interconnected. If there's anything that I've learned in the last number of years building this is that it's not simple, it's complex. Food and energy and climate, it's all deeply interconnected. It was her MBA at Dalhousie University that first made her think that a biotech venture could solve some of the world's biggest problems. That's how DeNova was born. One of the challenges we are is we can't find a protein that's low cost enough that is value aligned and meets our standards from a, from a sustainability standpoint. And then I realized, hey, this isn't just an agriculture problem. This is a global food system problem. Little did she know at the time, the answer would be a microbe buried in a wetland in New Brunswick. Rhiannon Davies is an investor who helped Stratton get it off the ground. She's a co-founder of Sandpiper Ventures, a women-led venture capital fund that invests in women-run tech startups. According to the World Economic Forum, only 2% of venture capital globally is invested in women-run companies. Davies says it's that rarity of funding that makes women so good at using it. Brianna is one of the most brilliant entrepreneurs that, that I have ever encountered. Um, in the way that she is incredibly dedicated to building a company in a purpose-driven way. It was the potential for scale within Stratton's master plan that initially impressed Davies. So almost like protein powder for fish food, uh, to make it very simple. Uh, but like these are protein powerhouses. So these organisms grow and they replicate and they get fed methanol. Um, and the process is very much like how beer is brewed. Um, so we use large vats, large stainless steel tank at scale um, in the labs. At the smaller scale, we use glass vessels. It's that scale and the potential need for DeNova's new protein that Stratton hopes will see the company make a change in food sustainability. Kathleen McKenna, CBC News, Dartmouth. The Maritime Museum of the Atlantic is saying goodbye to its mascot. Merlin the Macaw has been greeting visitors at the Halifax Museum for almost two decades. But museum staff say his health has been declining for the past few years and he's only 22. In a few weeks, he'll move to a zoo in Ontario so he can be around other exotic birds and maybe even learn to fly. We love Merlin very, very much, and Merlin's been a part of the museum family here since 2006. He was hatched in captivity so and spent the first couple of years of his life in a busy pet store. So he was used to a lot of people coming and going, and, um, and he's been a, a great addition to the museum. Unfortunately, around the time of the pandemic, during the pandemic, Merlin's began showing behavioral changes. You can see he doesn't have all of his feathers. Uh, he has a, a sort of a nervous twitch, is what we kind of understand, of, of breaking off some of his feathers. So we've been doing, as any, any 
caring family does when they have a, a, a an animal that they love in their lives, so, you know, seeking all of the medical attention that we can. We've, we've taken into account all of the recommendations for Merlin, but nonetheless, he continues to show some signs of, well, just not the best best well-being. Merlin and all macaws are very, very intelligent creatures. They love to spend time with other uh, macaws and we don't have other macaws here and we also don't have a, a, a focus in our work for looking after macaws. We don't have green spaces and we don't have um, veterinarians on staff. But uh, at Safari Niagara, which is where Merlin is, is going next week, uh, they have all those things. They have other macaws, they have a large number of exotic birds in their care, and they even have a, they even have a mate that they're hoping Merlin will enjoy the company of. And he has a long life ahead of him. Merlin, as I said, it will be 22 this year, and macaws in captivity can, can live 65, to 85, even 90 years of age. So he's got a long life ahead of him, and we're really, really happy that he's going to have really the, the best option that we can possibly imagine for him. Feeling both bad and excited mm, for Merlin. Poor Merlin, but yeah. maybe he will find love. Let's hope for the, hey, can I help you so? <laughs> First quick break on the way. Stay with us. There's a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. Work has not started yet on the Afghan War Memorial, but the monument is already the subject of controversy over how the contract was awarded. Yep, that's the kind of day it's been. Ryan is back with his full weather forecast. We'll see you in a few minutes.
Yeah, we've had nicer days in Nova Scotia, yeah, that's for yeah, sure. Especially, you know, it is April, but. Yeah. Yeah, we always typically get, you know, one, mm. hopefully just one. <laughs> for <laughs> no, your never, sake. Never just one. Is it? Uh, that, uh, you know, you turn the calendar, you think, mm. we're done. Yeah. Mm. People get snow tires taken off. Mm -hmm. Today, so, as yeah. a matter of fact. You did? This morning, you went yeah. through with yeah. it? Yeah. And I got mine done on Monday. Yeah, that's right. Oh, well. Sorry, so, folks. We're going to yeah. be okay, right? Tell You're going to be, be okay, okay, yeah, again. for sure. I mean, here in the city as well, you can see where um, as the heavier snow kind of ends and it starts to taper off a little bit and temperatures are just warm enough mm. uh, that uh, for the most part, the roads seem okay. Uh, it's inland higher terrain areas where we're seeing the webcams where the roads are more snow sure. covered and mm -hmm. that's where folks are going to have to be careful. After the snow moves out, we're already starting to see the showers, the drizzle and the fog moving in and the winds are picking up as well. And you can see on this webcam shot, those waves really starting to crash in there around uh, Somerville Beach. This is uh -huh. uh, quarter deck. And you can see, the, yeah, it's uh, some wave action there it's for sure. Churning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And the wind's starting to pick up. Uh, showers and drizzle there near two degrees right now. Now, the winds, as we said earlier, there is a wind warning in effect. Now, we look at uh, the current sustained winds. Right now, in that area, we're looking at sustained in the 30, 40, 50 kilometer per hour range. Westport at 61. Talking about the gusts, Westport gusting to 81. Uh, Backerow Point gusting to 92 at last check. Shelburne 63, Lunenburg 60. So those winds are picking up in the southwest, and uh, that is indeed where we have the wind warning in effect. That's our best chance for gusts near 90 through the uh, overnight hours tonight. Uh, this evening and into the overnight. Now for lace wet winds gusting to 120 overnight tonight and into tomorrow morning. And we are looking at the snowfall warning uh, in effect for Victoria County. As we said, everybody else under a special weather statement. So let's uh, show you the temperatures again. A little milder here is this milder air is creeping in, still holding on to the snow here in the northeast. Still a little warmer in Cape Breton before the snow arrives and that'll cool things down. And yeah, Snow pretty good here across uh, parts of the north and east right now. That's going to be, as I said, our best chance of picking up five to 10 centimeters and then a whole just lighter, messy mix of showers mixed with flurries on the back side of the system that's going to impact us over the next few days. Uh, snowfall outlook over the next 24 hours, just light accumulation um, for most of central uh, areas. And then this is again tonight where we're going to be looking at the five to 10 pockets, maybe as much as 15 locally and the highlands under that snowfall warning. Temperatures tonight are going to be ranging between one and three degrees. The winds will be for the most part east, but then becoming southerly as we move into the wee morning hours of tomorrow. Watch the timeline here of the wet snow as it works its way north by 6 a.m. Still in for Cape Breton. The rest of us showers drizzle and fog patches and the fog patches will be quite thick uh, at times tomorrow morning. So be mindful of that. Note the highlands hanging onto the snow tomorrow. Uh, let's time out the wind. Here's the peak wind and it kind of works its way along the Atlantic coastline this evening and into tomorrow morning. Cape Breton again Howling lighter winds further to the west as they do shift uh, in to a more southerly direction. Uh, highlands still gusting those lace wet winds even into tomorrow afternoon. The rest of us a lighter wind, no doubt about that. Temperatures tomorrow two, three, four, five, uh, and even six degrees for Inverness with the wind becoming southeast there. Uh, five and six degrees winds becoming southeasterly for the Northumberland shore as well. Uh, four, five and six degrees for the Fundy and Valley region. Uh, looking at uh, temperatures right around four, five degrees for the south shore and in through the metro area as well. And again, the fog patches for the mainland will ease as we move into the afternoon. There's Saturday, five degrees. Uh, looking at this low again, it is going to be slowly wandering to the east, uh, but lingering as we move through Saturday and Sunday with those showers and flurries. The solar eclipse, Tom and Amy, at the very least, it looks like a mix of sun and cloud, maybe some high cloud cover in the mix, but trending towards a mostly sunny uh, afternoon, which is good. We just need like you know, those five to 10 minutes where it's going to be near <laughs> its maximum here in Nova Scotia, right around 430 to 440. So we'll uh, keep you posted on that. I'll have another update, uh, obviously, right here tomorrow night. Yeah, looking right. promising at least. Okay, thanks, thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you. Up next, getting ready for the solar eclipse. I'll talk with Tiffany Fields at the Burke Gaffney Observatory at SMU about the big day. That's our newsmaker. Please stay with us. You are watching CBC Nova Scotia News.
The solar eclipse on Monday in this region is being billed as a once in a lifetime event. Astronomers and average Atlantic Canadians alike will be getting into position for the best view, but there are a few things you might want to keep in mind. Tiffany Fields is the astronomy technician at the Burke Gaffney Observatory at St. Mary's University in Halifax and here with us today. Thanks for coming in. Oh, thanks for having me. How excited are you about Monday? I, I'm really excited <laughs> um, and I may or may not have been planning for this eclipse for the last two years or so <laughs> um, and maybe even longer. I'm really excited to see the eclipse yeah, on Monday. Yeah, I bet you've been planning for it. So 1972, the last one. Absolutely. Um, quite some time before there's another one. These mm -hmm. things are quite rare. Are they more rare in this part of the world? No, so they're not any more rare in this part of the world, but they're just rare everywhere in the world. So the next total solar eclipse after the one on Monday that's coming through this region is in 2079. So it's quite a while for us to wait. Um, total solar eclipses happen somewhere in the world roughly every 18 months, but the path of totality where you can see the eclipse is pretty small, only 100 to 200 kilometers wide. Um, and you can imagine most of the Earth is ocean anyway, so many of those eclipses happen over ocean. To have an eclipse come through your area is roughly a once in a hundred year event. To have a total solar eclipse come right over your backyard is more like once in <laughs> 300 or 400 years, so we're pretty lucky here. Okay, for sure. Um, you talked about the path of totality there. Mm -hmm. Kind of walk people through that. What do you mean by that? So the path of totality is where on... Um, through the provinces, through the maritime provinces, New Brunswick, the upper half of Prince Edward Island and some of Newfoundland, is where the moon in the sky is going to entirely cover the disk of the sun. So this path of totality, like I mentioned, only about 150 kilometers wide for this eclipse, is going to go through the central United States, through southern Quebec and Ontario, up through the maritime provinces where we will be able to see it here. And indeed, this path is just where the shadow of the moon is going to cross the ground, block out the sun for a few minutes, depending on where you are. And so uh, there are better places to be than others, obviously. Absolutely. If you're here, I mean, some people would be driving to New Brunswick, weren't they? From If you're in Nova Scotia and you're close by that border, you're going to probably hop in your car, don't you think? I am planning on hopping in my car. <laughs> To go up to New Brunswick. Uh, so, of course, we're here in Halifax. Uh, I am planning to go into New Brunswick so I can be in the path of totality on Monday. And I imagine many others are as well. I would think so. Get there early, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, you mentioned Halifax there. What will people in Halifax see? So, here in Halifax and in most of Nova Scotia, except for a small bit of Cape Breton Island, we are going to see a partial solar eclipse. So, here in Halifax specifically, the moon is going to cover up at most about 94.5% of the sun's disk. Now, 94.5% sounds very close to 100, uh, but it's really not, not the same as being in totality. But with the partial eclipse, near the maximum uh, eclipse, which is going to be around 4.30 in the afternoon for us here in Nova Scotia, during maximum eclipse, I'm interested in hearing, uh, for those that stay around the area, if we notice the sky gets just a little bit darker, not very much, but just a little bit. Maybe the temperature will drop just a little bit uh, as we get towards that maximum eclipse. So here in Nova Scotia and uh, during any of the other phases, the partial phases of the eclipse, anywhere you are in the Maritimes, it's important to observe the eclipse safely. So with something like a pair of eclipse glasses or an indirect method to view the eclipse. Yeah, the temptation to look at it is, is real, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so the, the special glasses, what about cameras, phones, that kind of thing? What, what should people be cautionary, cautionary about? So the sun's really bright, of course. The sun is not comfortable to look at on a normal day. Um, there's a lot of power coming from the sun. If you point your camera up towards the sun, you risk damaging the sensors. If you point your eyeballs up towards the sun, you risk causing permanent eye injury. Um, so with cameras and the like, I recommend using proper solar filters. Say if somebody has a DSLR camera to put a, if they've got one, a special solar filter in front of the lens. If you don't have a special solar filter, don't point your camera up towards the sun. For something like cell phones, the thing that I would do carefully is maybe use a pair of eclipse glasses behind the lens um, of your cell phone to try to take an image if you would like to of the of the partial eclipse. Okay, if you're someone who wears glasses too, yes. what side of the glasses do the, uh, the special glasses go on? The eclipse glasses always go on the outside. The eclipse glasses need to take in the sunlight first before anything else. Because the issue is if you're wearing your usual glasses, maybe your usual glasses focus the light a little bit on those eclipse glasses if they're inside closer to your eyes, they might damage them a little bit. So we want the eclipse glasses to get the sunlight first, they must be on the outside. And when this eclipse happens, it happens pretty quickly, doesn't it? So 
The whole solar eclipse actually lasts a little bit more than a two than two hours. Uh, here in the Maritimes, it goes about 3:30 p.m. until about 5:45 p.m. Exact times change depending on exactly where you are. But totality, mm -hmm. when the moon is entirely covering up the sun in the sky, that moment that really um, brings out the oohs and the ahs, <laughs> that's a pretty short moment. Uh, depending on where you are in that path of totality, if you're closer to the center, uh, totality will last about three and a half minutes. If you're closer to the edge, it could be more like 30 seconds. So it's pretty quick in the span of the whole eclipse. Promises to be an exciting day for sure. Oh, I'm so excited. Thanks for coming and talking to us about it. Thank you for having me. Coming up, schools are dealing with severe teacher shortages that could leave some students behind. A team of architects is threatening legal action over a planned Afghan war national monument in Ottawa. The winners of the design competition claim they lost the multi-million dollar contract because of politics. The CBC's Daniel LeBlanc reports. This is where a new national monument to Canada's mission in Afghanistan is supposed to be built. But the project has been mired in controversy for months. It's a major 
piece of public art, but there was political uh, interference. More than 40,000 Canadians served in Afghanistan between 2001 and 2014. 158 military personnel and seven civilians died. In 2014, the Harper government promised a large public monument to commemorate the mission. The design was supposed to be selected by a jury, but the process took a twist last June. It is my honour to announce that the selection design for the national monument to Canada's mission in Afghanistan is from Team Stinson. A team of Quebec architects won the competition, but Veterans Affairs gave the contract to a group led by Indigenous artist Adrian Stimson. The department said his design was more popular amongst members of the military community in an online poll. Overwhelmingly, they responded that for them, the Stimson concept really represented for them the loss, the sacrifice and the courage of the men and women that served in Afghanistan. The Quebec-based team is refusing to give up and is threatening to take the government to court, saying they should have been awarded the full contract. We're very concerned because it does create a precedent, a very dangerous precedent for the history of Canada in terms of competition, uh, public art competition, architectural competition and so on. Former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour worked on the Quebec project as an advisor. She says she recently protested the issue to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in a private phone call. When you have a procurement process for the expenditure of Canadian taxpayers' money, the expectation is you follow the rules. Arbour fears the new monument, whenever it is built, will be forever tainted by the controversy. Daniel Leblanc, CBC News, Ottawa. U.S. President Joe Biden is telling Israel's Prime Minister to take steps to protect civilians and aid workers in Gaza or risk losing support for the Israeli offensive. The U.S. has been Israel's staunchest ally for decades, but both are dealing with international pressure following the recent airstrike that killed seven aid workers in Gaza. Chris Reyes has more. The president felt strongly that it was time to, to talk to Prime Minister Netanyahu about his concerns. That conversation happened over the phone, lasted 30 minutes, and was a direct result of Monday's Israeli airstrike that killed seven aid workers delivering food with the charity World Central Kitchen. The message from President Biden to the Israeli Prime Minister, protect civilians and aid workers in Gaza and move on an immediate ceasefire to allow supplies into the enclave and the release of hostages. The president made it clear that our policies with respect to Gaza uh, will be dependent upon our assessment of how well the Israelis uh, make changes and implement changes uh, to, to make the situation in Gaza better for the Palestinian people. The Biden administration has not made clear what those policy changes will be, but Secretary of State Antony Blinken appeared confident Israel will deliver on the changes. It's. Uh our expectation that um, Israel uh, will and certainly should announce concrete, specific, measurable steps that uh, it will take and take as soon as possible uh, to make sure that there can be an effective surge in assistance, that it can be sustained, uh, and that humanitarian workers and civilians are better protected. Well, well, well. Pressure on Israel to change course in Gaza is mounting almost six months into the conflict as the civilian death toll rises and the enclave's population teeters on the brink of famine. In the UK, 600 lawyers and academics have sent a letter to their prime minister demanding the British government stop arming Israel. From the family of the aid workers killed on Monday, outrage. If it was a terrible mistake, then the Israeli military is extremely incompetent. From other aid workers, frustration that they can't do their jobs when it's needed most. We have been saying it for weeks now. This pattern of attacks is either intentional or indicative of reckless incompetence. Israel maintains Monday's attack on aid workers was a mistake, but has yet to respond to U.S. demands on policy changes. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. As you saw, foreign ministers gathered at NATO headquarters in Brussels today to mark the organization's 75th anniversary. In a speech, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said the alliance was, quote, bigger, stronger and more united than ever. He also said it's critical that the U.S. and other member states support the alliance, especially in light of the crisis in Ukraine. 
Fair burden sharing is essential. And Europe is investing more, much more. This year, the majority of NATO allies will invest at least 2% of their GDP in defense. The alliance is now considering establishing a fund to provide long-term military support for Ukraine. That would ensure that aid to the country is not jeopardized by political changes in member states. Established four years after the Second World War, NATO now has 32 member states. Sweden is the most recent addition to the alliance, having just joined weeks ago. The latest report from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says housing starts are expected to decline this year. That's due to the delayed effect of higher interest rates on new construction. The CMHC says new builds will start picking up again in 2025 and 2026 and could heat, hit peak levels and set new highs. Home prices and sales will also rise, driven by high demand. Rental housing will remain in short supply, leading to higher rent costs and lower vacancy rates in coming years. Schools across Canada are dealing with severe teacher shortages, leaving principals to make some tough choices about, uh, about how days in the classroom will unfold for students, and that risks leaving some behind. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson takes a look behind the problem. Start formulating a plan. And, you know, for this someone, former you know, principal knows the scramble when a lot of teachers call in uh, sick. You know, do I combine classes? Do I cancel music for the day? Uh, will I have to teach a class? Uh, will I have to cancel prep, uh, prep time for teachers? And the kids feel the effect of it. When those trusting relationships are negatively impacted, uh, we tend to see some very, you know, um, concerning things. We see changes in behavior. The Ontario-based advocacy group People for Education surveyed more than 1,000 principals in the province who painted a grim picture of just how bad the situation is. 24% of elementary and 35% of secondary schools report facing daily shortages in teaching staff. And it's not just in Ontario. We are having evidence surfacing from across the country. This education professor says while there were shortages before the pandemic, COVID-19 made the situation worse. So if there was this group who were close to retirement who sought early retirement, so that reduced the number of available teachers in schools. Equally, uh, teachers who had recently retired, who in a typical situation would return to supply or substitute teach once or twice or three times a week, they were not returning into schools during COVID because they didn't want to put themselves at risk. And we had our meeting with uh, MJ Stolls yesterday. Oh. Just this February, Newfoundland and Labrador brought together both the teachers and government officials to tackle the problem. We do have some housing units available in some of our communities for our teachers and in others. We do a house stipend which gives them a, a portion towards their rent. But even there the teacher union said in a statement the government's efforts fell short underfunding key problem areas like packed classrooms and violence in schools. As teacher shortages proves to be an equation few know how to solve. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. More than 200 musical artists are calling for protection against artificial intelligence technology. They include some of the biggest names in the industry. They've signed an open letter about the use of AI to undermine or replace human songwriters and artists. Eli Glasner has more. Is it beyond intelligence? As if the soul not exist? That's a little taste of evolution. A new song from Sheryl Crow where she explores her concerns around the use of artificial intelligence in the music industry. Now, Crow is part of a group of more than 200 artists who are now calling on AI developers and technology companies to stop using AI to undermine or devalue their work. Now, the letter is from an organization called Artist Rights Alliance. Other artists lending their support include Elvis Costello, Stello, Nicki Minaj, the estate of Frank Sinatra, and Canadian artists such as the Arkells and Diana Krall. In a recent interview with Tom Power on Q, the musician Cheryl Crow talked about her concerns over AI and its use, increasing use, in the music industry. You know, it terrifies me that artists can be brought back from the dead. It terrifies me that I can sing to you a song that I had absolutely nothing to do with, and you'll believe it. 
Jen Jacobson is the executive director of the group that organized the letter. She says that AI is also a concern for estates managing the rights of artists such as Frank Sinatra. A lot of that um, royalty potential is being cut into by AI in various ways. You know, sometimes we're seeing now these deep fakes and voice clones where people are are uh, taking an, a famous artist and, and um, uh, uh, exploiting their likeness that way. And with the abilities of AI software increasing, musicians already struggling with decreasing income from music streaming rights are worried about being replaced. Tiff Merritt is an Americana musician. I've spent 25 years honing my, my touch, my voice, my point of view, um, my writing sensibilities, and that's now being used to train AI to imitate and replace me. Uh, and, and robots do not get royalties. Their content is free. Organizers and artists are calling on AI developers and technology companies to work with artists ethically so that this technology doesn't further devalue their work. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto.
Yeah, The Path of Totality mm. sounds like a sci-fi novel <laughs> title or something, doesn't it? Path of Totality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Folks are pretty excited about it, though. Yeah, they yeah. are. And uh, I want to just share this graphic because uh, a lot of folks wondering, you know, where to get into that mm -hmm. Path of sure. Totality. Uh, not, you know, if you're going to travel all the way down to Texas, that is where we are starting. <laughs> you better get uh, going now. Yeah. now yeah. But I think what's remarkable about this graphic is it shows how quickly it will cross North America. So this is our time, Atlantic time. 327 is when it rolls in to Texas from Mexico and rolls through places like, yes, Dallas, Fort Worth into the mix as it tracks up into Arkansas, Little Rock getting into the mix there. Uh, and look how quickly it is moving across the continent very quickly. The entire thing will really last only an hour to an hour and a half really for most. And then it will squeak into the greater Toronto area. It looks like Niagara Falls and Buffalo will get in uh, to, uh, to view this. Uh, again, they'll be in the path of totality. Montreal will be right on the border of the path of totality. A few seconds, they will see that. And then into our neck of the woods. And really, this is when we will notice the most obscured part of the sun as well is around 430 mm -hmm. to 4. Uh, 35 and you can see Fredericton uh, in there, Miramichi, Moncton just on the outside looks like north end of town okay you're into 100% <laughs> not quite in the south end of town and then of course for PEI and then across into Newfoundland. One quick look at the cloud cover forecast a lot of folks flocking to Texas not looking so good there mm -hmm. oh, yeah. as we work our way to the northeast it actually looks like okay. the northeast parts of the U.S. and into the Maritimes, the best yeah. places to Good view. News. might win there. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Well, with soaring temperatures in parts of India, workers at an elephant rescue and rehabilitation center are going to great lengths to keep the animals cool. They've been enjoying mud baths and swimming. <laughs> Yes, this five-year-old center is home to 11 elephants that were rescued from owners who had them illegally or couldn't take care of them. The animals were provided with veterinary care and exceptional diets. No steak and mashed potatoes for these <laughs> gentle giants, though. They prefer a mix of grains, veggies, and fruits. Uh, having a great time, I think. They are. Yeah. That's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.